Lascavo Prossimo, welcome. And a particularly warm welcome to our Ukrainian colleagues, wherever you are currently scattered. We are so pleased that you're able to join us and that we can meet with you in this place. For those of you who don't know, my name is Catherine Cox and I'm one of the organisers of this event. With me is my colleague Catherine Hines, who I'm hoping will be waving, and also a number of members of the organising committee. Throughout the planning of this event, it has been very difficult to find the words to express our grief and distress at the atrocities currently being inflicted on you and your country. We watch horrified and powerless. It feels as if there is a huge gulf between the extremes of your situation and the ordinariness of our lives. How can we possibly reach across to you? Any words and actions feel so inadequate. This event is a moment in time, but I do feel that it is symbolic of something very important. It expresses how you and your country are held in our hearts and minds throughout this time. We care and we do want to stand with you. Also today, we welcome those colleagues who have been working so tirelessly to try and support Ukrainian refugees. The rest of us are hundreds and even thousands of miles away. So we thank you for all that you are doing and the burden you have taken up. We wish you strength and resilience in your challenging work. One of our greatest discoveries whilst organising this event has been learning what you our Ukrainian colleagues are yourselves doing. So many of you are displaced, homeless, separated from sons, husbands, elderly parents. You are all grieving, not just for lost family and friends and homes, but for the devastation of your country, for those whose bodies have been tortured and violated, for those who have been abducted. This would be enough to break any of us. And yet, you are out there, exhausted, traumatised, mainly unpaid, but still serving your communities. You are running seminars and workshops, providing emergency psychological support, learning new skills and approaches, involved in all sorts of projects with both adults and children. You support one another and engage with others in the world. It is extraordinary how you find the strength, courage, fortitude, compassion, availability, when you each have so much suffering of your own to bear, to be able to support others as you do. It's phenomenal. We can but stand in admiration. You are indeed valiant among us. It is a privilege to have you as colleagues. And we look forward to the day when you will teach us more from your experience. But enough from me. The running order for this afternoon is as follows. In a moment, I will invite you all to join me in the auction lounge, which is in the same place. We will then have presentations from the two Ukrainian Jungian associations, after which Anne Yulanov's talk. The auction results, thanks, and close. So let's get underway. Please join me in the auction lounge. It says a great deal about how much the Jungian community cares about our Jungian Ukrainian colleagues that we have so many of our auction analysts actually present today. In fact, we have so many that Zoom can't cope with putting the whole lounge on the screen at one time. I know you'd like to hear from them all, so we're going to have two lounges. Now, unfortunately, we only have a very short amount of time per analyst, but the auction analysts have been asked by some of our Ukrainian colleagues if they would consider running some webinars 
for analytically oriented psychologists and therapists in Ukraine. So perhaps today we can just see this as a preliminary hello from them with more to come in the months ahead. So I am going to ask Joe <clears throat> Cambray to start us off. Joe, as many of you will know, is president of Pacifica Graduate Institute, past president of the International Association of Analytical Psychology, previously editor of the Journal of Analytical Psychology and a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. Joe. Thanks so much, Catherine, and thank all of you for being here. It's a deeply moving and um, a very somber uh, occasion. I'm very glad that we can at least make this effort. It, it's not enough, obviously. Let me just say a, a word about Pacifica. We have a Ukrainian-born faculty member. We have some Ukrainian students. We have, during the, this crisis, we have joined in the, the Alliance of College and University Presidents to uh, petition Secretary of State Anthony Blinken successfully so that we have temporary protected status for all of our students from Ukraine so that there can't be any visa problems during during the course of the conflict. Uh, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket, but it's really important. The other thing I'll say very briefly is I'm taken back to a number of conferences I've been involved in around crises of freedom and just how important uh, freedom is to analytic work. I can't commend our colleagues enough um, to freely associate, to actively imagine, to be able to dream productively, to do dream work, all requires freedom. Freedom ex first externally. We must live in a place without repression and tyranny for us to be able to truly have access to the range of our psyches. And then, of course, internally, how we process that. So I want to thank you all for uh, allowing us to have a few words in honor of your great efforts to maintain and, and really carry freedom forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Dale Mathers, known to many of you, has published widely on diverse subjects such as supervision, alchemy, and climate change. Originally a psychiatrist, he was, among other things, a Mental Health Foundation Research Fellow at St George's Hospital in London. Dale. Uh, Dale, you need to unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Uh, it's been very wonderful to see so many of my friends in Ukraine in the large group. Um, I was introduced to your wonderful country by my friend and supervisor, Richard Wainwright, who helped start the different Ukrainian interests in Jung. Uh, I first went to Kiev quite a while ago and remember seeing St. Sophia's and the monastery and watching and taking part in the Russian Orthodox, Russian, Ukrainian, whatever you call it, an Orthodox service. Um, that was very moving, particularly that people could go in and out. They could be in the service and they could come out of it. <clears throat> Since then, I've been back for summer schools, teaching in Odessa, although the pandemic has interrupted that. Um, on Tuesday, every afternoon on Tuesday, I supervise colleagues in Kiev, Kharkiv, um, <clears throat> and in Odessa, at least that's what I used to do, because they are now scattered all over the place, <laughs> Germany, Czech Republic, West Ukraine, and Moldova. This is deeply upsetting for me and for them. They, they have all very bravely managed to continue doing their analytic work, therapy, counselling, setting up groups for other refugees and doing social dreaming. I particularly recall my supervisee from Kharkiv, who we managed to make a connection because the electricity and internet had been restored. And uh, just as we were starting supervision, the air raid siren went off and I said, do you want to stop because there's an air raid going on? And she said, oh, fuck the Russians. Um, I've been waiting two weeks to have this supervision. My patient's in a crisis. Can we just get on with it? 
so we got on with it. Um, <laughs> I think that's Thank you, Dan. great. Thank you. Thank you. Ursula Wirtz is an author, Jungian analyst and clinical psychologist based in Zurich. Of her many publications, the most recent was the very well received Trauma and Beyond, The Mystery of Transformation. I'm Ursula. I have never been to your beautiful country, but I have been to other war-struck countries. And I worked with mass-raped women. And I'm here to sort of share with you my experiences of like healing circles, women's circles. Um, the necessity, I think, of sharing and witnessing in the agony um, of what you all are experiencing. And yet to provide hope that there is unbrokenness in brokenness. That's all I want to say for the moment. Thank you, Ursula. George Hokanson is a senior training analyst in Chicago, but prior to that had 20 years experience in the military and strategic planning. His book, Jung's Str Struggle with Freud is well known, as well as his works on archetypes, synchronicity, and the nature of symbolism. Over to you, George. Thank you, Catherine. Let me first start by saying that I've met so many of you at international conferences when I was on the executive committee uh, of the IAAP and as vice president, and I think of you regularly. And I do want to say that the Chicago Society of Jungian Analysts has paid very careful attention to what's taking place in Ukraine. We've had many discussions about it, and I can tell you that the entire Chicago Society of Analysts stands resolutely with you as colleagues in this extremely trying time. Catherine mentioned that I have a background in military matters. I have no illusions about the nature of war and how horrible it can be. And when I do think about it from that standpoint, I stand in awe of the fortitude that the Ukrainian people have shown in the face of an extraordinarily vicious and unnecessary attack. I would hope that we will be able to see a time when all of this will have passed by and we can work together again to restore Ukraine. Uh, in, that, in that spirit, I, I, I hope that I will be available whenever it's asked to provide you with whatever resources I can provide and that my colleagues will be able to provide. Thank you, George. Susan Schwartz, like Ursula, is a member of the organizing committee for this event. Every time a new person joined our meetings, they would refer to her book, The Absent Father Effect on Daughters. She has another book being published by Routledge next year on the ASIF personality, imposter syndrome and illusions in the mirror. Susan. Um, well, I want to thank you all for my participation and all that I have learned from listening to this also this entire day and I think one of the important things is how we really listen and speak to each other and are really open to what will hopefully evolve and just on a very personal note I had very little to do with Ukraine until about a year ago and then the Ukrainians quite wonderfully were going to translate my book on absent fathers but because of the war, it has been interrupted. And yet, even though it has been interrupted, there is hope that it will continue, not only from me, but from the wonderful people in Ukraine that I have interacted with. And it has brought to me, and I hope that I bring forward as well, an openness and ability to talk, understand, and feel with all of the intensity of what is going on. I think that's um, a time of many words and no words at the same moment. Thank you, Susan. 
And I think the other two people in this lounge have sort of dropped off a little bit because of the size of this lounge. But um, I'd also like to welcome Christopher Hawke and Dimitri Zalesko, who are here somewhere. Um, maybe they'll give a quick wave from wherever they are. Um, oh, there we are. I can see Christopher. Um, Chris is a PhD supervisor at the University of London. He's an archetypal film consultant for film production companies overseeing story development and narrative. He's also directed several short films himself, so something a little different there. Thank you, Chris, for participating. And I see now Dimitro's in shot, and we will be hearing from Dimitro very shortly. So thank you um, to everyone in Lounge A, and I don't know whether Confer can do a very quick shift and bring us the analysts from the second lounge, the second half of the lounge, and Shira is well known for her work on the ways in which ancient myths can illuminate patterns in contemporary collective and individual psychology. That sounds incredibly relevant to the battle between the gods we are witnessing today. Welcome, Anne. Thank you very much. Um, what a privilege to be here. I I'm in awe of the little we've managed to learn of our, the work of our Ukrainian colleagues absolutely in awe of it. So moved, I can hardly talk. I woke up this morning very unsettled, very apprehensive, completely out of order. How could I be with a suffering I could barely imagine? It seemed when I woke this morning an impossible task. And I've been wrestling with it all day, really. But of course, it's a question that psychotherapists have to ask themselves just about every day of their work at different levels. How can I be with the suffering? What can we do? We can feel very helpless, I think. I can, anyway. But what we can do is to learn to witness. That may be the most we can do, and it may be something enormous in the end. To witness the suffering, the extraordinary strength it calls out, and the glimmers of meaning that emerge. So I want to learn to bear witness. And in doing so, I, I want to hold on to one of me, Jung's most important acts of faith. As we know, his psychology is intensely about the individual, but it's also about something so much larger, in which every individual is embedded and from which they draw their psychological life. A level of psyche in which mysteriously, and whatever our huge and manifest differences, we're all united. And I try to hold on to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Marciano's voice will be familiar to everyone who listens to this Jungian life on car journeys and elsewhere. Based in Philadelphia, Lisa has just published to much acclaim her first book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself. Lisa. Well, I, I want to thank the, the organizing committee for organizing this and also for inviting me. I remember the morning I opened up my email and had the invitation to participate in this. And I was so grateful to be given an opportunity to give back for such a worthy cause in, 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 in a way that I could. So I, I am so appreciative of that. You know, I want to I think um, a focus on, on community. For me, uh, my professional society has been a home for me. It's, it's such an important source of, of community. And uh, I'm just aware that we as Jungians have, um, you know, we have a way of looking at the world. We value the psyche. We have a common language. We, we are an, an international family. 
and uh, to be able to reach out to my Ukrainian colleagues and suppress uh, and express my support for, for that part of my family whom I don't know. But I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Sodo Shandasani really needs no introduction since his meticulously researched work on the red books and black books dramatically changed the world of analytical psychology. It was actually while reading Sonu's excellent introduction to the black books that I had the idea of the subject for Anne's talk. Sonu. Thank you. 15th August, 1947. It was only when she was in her eighties, my mother started to speak of experience in the partition of India aged 14. Her father had died when she was young and she and her two sisters were brought up by their mother in Hyderabad, Sindh. She spoke of how they were given a couple of hours notice that they were about to leave. An uncle had managed to book a carriage on a train to Ahmedabad, 300 miles away across the new border for young Sindhi ladies. She spoke of how they were told to remain completely silent to never step outside the carriage. She spoke of the joy when the she and her sisters were reunited with their mother a few days later, whom they never thought they would see again. Shortly after they left, there was a massacre where they lived in Hyderabad. She spoke of how the family came to live in a flat, sorry, live for several months in a single room in Bombay. In India, uncles and aunts extend beyond the already extended families. 24th February, 2022. It's time for us to be the uncles and aunts of the Ukrainians and offer sanctuary and support in whatever ways we can. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. Marion Dunlee joins us from Ireland, from where she's been running a new training that integrates somatic experiencing, neuroscience, trauma and developmental trauma with analytical psychology. Marion. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this event. Um, I'm very, very touched to be part of it and uh, have been on the sidelines watching, like most people here, uh, television and um, our images that come on our, tele on our iPhones. And I want to say that, that um, this morning I was listening to Thomas Hubel, who works with trauma and uh, global trauma and collective trauma. And one of the things he said that resonated deeply with my experience is that the deepest trauma is often mute. And I feel I've been quite muted in myself since the outbreak and the preparations for the war and then the outbreak of the war. And when I was listening today, I was thinking, how do we call ourselves forward from this place of freeze? to support each other, to listen to each other, to grow our capacity to be present. And really, um, this is an invitation that I'm putting out to myself. And I hope to learn more in my experience of working with this community of Ukrainian analysts who are so present to what is happening at the moment. And thank you for this opportunity and to my colleagues that we're sharing this space today. Thank you, Marion. Don Kalshed needs no introduction. Among his numerous publications, his books, The Inner World of Trauma, Archetypal Defenses of the Personal Spirit, and more recently, Trauma and Soul, A Psycho-Spiritual Approach to Human Development and Its Interruption, are widely considered to be essential reading. Don. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for this chance. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very appreciative for this opportunity to join you uh, in this, uh, this sad and poignant uh, and hopefully transformative uh, community meeting. <clears throat> 
as you know, I wrote a book called Trauma and the Soul. And sometimes in our work with traumatic experience, we see the psyche broken open to the soul and its suffering. Even though sometimes that suffering is, is first, as Marion just said, mute and um, maybe just, just the body weeping, but, but no words, for example. If we can hold this suffering in consciousness and allow its many facets to be expressed in a democracy of the psyche, and um, Jung firmly believed that the soul, the psyche was a democracy. If we can hold those facets and allow them to be present in, this, in the field with the patient, then sometimes we're able to witness a remarkable transformation uh, in consciousness and a healing. And I think this is what your nations, the Ukrainian nation is, is going through right now. I had a chance to write a letter of support to the Ukrainian psychotherapist back in, in March 10th uh, at, on the invitation of a friend from Pacifica, Oksana Yakushko. And I tried to communicate in that short note that I feel that what you're fighting for is so profound and so important. Um, it's for democracy, but the, the essence and the core of democracy as Jung helped us understand is the diversity of the psyche and the diversity of the soul and the freedom in that diversity. As Joe Cambry said in his introductory remarks, you can't do this work without freedom of thought and freedom of feelings. So I think it's really on behalf of a revolution in consciousness that is starting to happen on this planet. It, it started in Athens many, many years ago and it's born fruit recently and and uh, you're fighting for it in ukraine we're trying to keep it in america if we can against the forces of autocracy within the country but it's worth fighting for and uh it, it um it's a profoundly important thing to me and i'm very glad to be a part of this conversation thank you thank you don and thank you to all of the auction analysts who've already been warned that we'll be in touch with them next week to see how we're going to take this forward. Um, as you know, there is an element of this that's a fundraiser. We're trying to raise some uh, money to um, share with our Ukrainian colleagues and um, help them get a few basic essentials. So I'm going to hand over for the auction element to Susan Schwartz. Hello. Um, I'm now going to explain how the auction itself will work. We have 18 fabulous prizes. Each prize is an hour with one of the following eminent Jungians, many of whom we have heard from. And I'll just read the list rather quickly. Donald Kolshed, Murray Stein, Polly Young Eisendrath, Joe Cambray, Ursula Wirtz, Joe Hogan, George Hoganson, Dale Mathers, and Shearer, Sonu Shamdasani, Lisa Marciano, Dimitro Zaleski, Tom Singer, Marianne Dunlay, Reynos Papadopoulos, Lionel Corbett, Christopher Hawk, Verena Cast, and myself. By bidding in the auction, you agree to pay a hundred pounds if you win the prize. And since this is a fundraiser, you can also choose to donate a hundred pounds, even if you don't win. You can enter for yourself, or if you would like to share the cost, you can enter on behalf of a group. You will now have a poll appear on your screen asking you if you would like to bid in the auction. You can reply yes or no, and there is a third option, which allows you to donate your 100 pounds, even if you don't win. Please tick your answer to the question on your screen now. The poll will close in one minute. The finance committee will then draw the names on the 18 bidders at random and then randomly match each one with one of our prize analysts. Each winner will be contacted next week and asked to make payment and they will then be given the contact details for their prize analyst. The lucky winners will be announced at the end of today's event. The winners' names will also appear on the website. 
for our Ukrainian colleagues, there will be a separate auction with no charge. The names of the participating analysts will be put in a hat again, and two names will be drawn out. UJA will get an hour with one eminent analyst and USAP with the other. The poll will now close. Thank you very much for participating. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague on the organizing committee, Catherine Hines. Hello, good evening, everybody. I'm Catherine Hines, and I'm now going to introduce our two Ukrainian um, Jungian analysts, Dmitro Zaleski and Nina Kirilyuk. And first, Dmitro. Dmitro Zaleski is a doctor, psychiatrist, and Jungian analyst. He was first. He was the first Jungian analyst in Ukraine, first president of the official development group of the International Association of Analytical Psychology, the IAP in Ukraine. And since 2006, he's been conducting three-year, 600-hour theoretical and supervisory programs in analytical psychology. 35 graduates became routers and members of the IAP. He lectures on the theory and practice of analytical psychology and provides translations of a series of Jungian works into Russian and Ukrainian. He has given presentations at national, European and world congresses on analytical psychology. From 2010 to 2014, Dimitrio has been a supervisor and lecturer on the IAP programme in Krasnodar, Russia. And since 2019, he's been a supervisor and lecturer on the IEP program in Almaty, Kazakhstan. And since 2020, he's the supervisor and lecturer on the IEP program in Ljubljana, Slovenia. He served in the armed forces of Ukraine for mobilization as chief of his battalion's medical service in 2015 to 2016. And during the current Russian-Ukrainian war, he is head of the Mobile Medical Center of Territorial Defense, South Kyiv region. And Ina, I'd like to introduce Ina Kirilyuk, is a Jungian analyst, a member of the International Association of Analytical Psychology, and the president of the Ukrainian Jungian Association, the UJA, one of the two training organizations in Ukraine. Ina was forced to leave Ukraine and is now a refugee living in Poland. Her husband and sons remain in Ukraine and serve in the armed forces of Ukraine. Ina and seven other UJA analysts work as crisis psychologists with their clients working online, offering support groups, study groups, training webinars and seminars in the most difficult situations. Ina continues to work to offer containment to those who are still studying and offers weekly seminars and supervision groups. We welcome both Ina and Dimitrio, and Ina is going to speak first. Хочу всіх привітати з нашою зустрічю сьогодні під час війни. Ми об'єдналися для єдності, підтримки та майбутнього. Дякую за можливість бути з вами. Я хотіла б почати зі слів своїй бабусі, які вона казала як головне побажання щоб ніколи більше не було війни. Тоді я її не розуміла. Тепер я також буду бабусею, яка каже, щоб ніколи не було війни. Зараз я її зрозуміла. Війна почалася в Україні вранці о четвертій годині. Ці ганебні паралелі ми всі знаємо. Війна прийшла до нас замість світанку. О четвертій годині ми почули вибухи ракет, Авіаудари розбудили Київ та всю країну. Смерть йшла через границю на техніці зі свастикою. Там, де пройшов русський солдат, залишилося масове поховання мирних людей. 229 дітей вбиті російськими солдатами. Більш 5 мільйонів біженців покинули Україну. Це переважно жінки та діти. На 10 травня було зареєстровано 15 657 злочинів проти України, в тому числі 10 619 злочинів, агресії та воєнних злочинів. Більше 2 тисяч ракет вдарили по нашій землі, десятки міст зрівняли з землею, села спалені. 
Всі знають, хто в цьому винен. Вбивати, вбивати, засіяти Європу трупами – ось ціль Російської Федерації. Але ми знаємо, принцип енантіодрамії працює. Як казав наш президент Володимир Зеленський, немає такого бункера, щоб сховатися від Бога. Свобода, єдність, стійкість та справедливість – ось цінності українського народу, і вони переможуть. Уінстон Черчилль казав, якщо ви йдете через ад, йдіть до кінця, не, зупиня... не зупиняючись. Цей меседж дуже влучний саме зараз, бо ми на півдорогі, нам важливо втримати серединний шлях між Сицилою та Гаріддою у різних сенсах цього вислову, у військовому, політичному, у людському. Як, як і як юнг'янцям між дією та свідомістю, між зовнішньою позицією та внутрішнім діалогом. Юнг був надзвичайно інтуїтивний. Гостра інтуїція допомогла йому відчути сув в колективній свідомості заздалегідь. Він писав про, актив... про активацію архетипу апокаліпсису та признавав, що архетип апокаліпсису існує і активний в нашому колективному несвідомому. Війна – це його головна презентація. Юнг відчував, що людям важливо знати про цей архетип, тому що він визнавав силу, яка має кожна особистість, щоб змінити майбутнє. Саме зараз юнгіанська місія полягає в тому, щоб Достатня кількість людей усвідомили апокаліпсис як архетип, зрозуміли його напрями, наміри та засвоїли його значення в своєму особистому житті. Тоді доля світу буде більш позитивною. Україна, український народ дуже багато втрачає життя, домівку, землю. На старий все світ зруйнований. Але ці втрати дають нам надію пережити оновлення та зцілення. Відбудувати нову силу та духовність. Я вірю, що це не тільки український шлях до іншої внутрішньої реальності, яка більше відповідає нашому духу та новій етиці. Це можливість для всього світу оновитися. Ця війна – поштовх до великої трансформації. Як інв'янці в своїх кабінетах, ми невпинно працюємо на користь зцілення світу, укріплення мі- миру, примирення боротьби, Протилежності. Ми допомагаємо людям робити свою внутрішню роботу, розуміючи, що всі справжні зміни, які трансформують реальність на фундаментальному рівні, починаються з окремих людей, з вас і мене, і залишить від нас. Все починається з особистої відповідальності. На мою думку, саме це прагнення особистого внеску, душевного поклику нас всіх сьогодні тут зібрало, як рицарів круглого столу щоб своїми індивідуаційними зусиллями спрямувати нашу цивілізацію в сторону добра, до повноти реалізації людського потенціалу. Ми, українські аналітики, багато працюємо, бо у нас є багаторічна підготовка знання та готовність підтримувати аналізантів, суперзантів, колег та студентів. З першого дня війни у ЮА проводить групи підтримки, рефлексивні групи, навчальні вебінари, семінари, як у відкритому, так і закритому форматі. До нашої справи долучилися юнг'янські аналітики зі всього світу, і ми не зупиняємося. Цей акт солідарності та підтримки миттєво надало нам АІП десятки національних спільнот. Зустріч сьогодні – це великий контейнер для великої тривоги та біди. Ми щиро вдячні англійським колегам за велику працю та підтримку саме сьогодні. Також, як професійна юнгянська асоціація в Україні, ми розуміємо, що професійні, професійні виклики дуже великі та суттєві. Як бути аналітиком під час війни, як змінюється аналітична рамка війни, як все це осмислювати і не втратити глузд. Бо травма більше, ніж компетентність любого роду, вона заповнює, заповнює все навколо нас. Тому ми, 10 аналітиків, членів УЛА, постійно працюємо з колегами у форматі рефлексивних груп та міні-семінарів, щоб разом робити важливу роботу осмислення, континування та знаходження нових сенсів. Щиро дякуємо Тошу Каваї, Містер Бер, Баті Брашпальмоні, Раджині Гудайте, Тому Келі, Генрі Бабович, Урону Колману, Джен Віннер, Мартіну Шміту за регулярний та послідовний супробіт, який надає ви нашій спільноті. 
Бо я казав Біон, щоб осмислити найтривожніші думки, потрібні два розуми. Міжнародна спільнота зараз для української спільноти надає другий розум для осмислення. І сьогодні це велике коло солідарності – це також другий розум для нашої загальної трансформації. І на останок. Травма і її зцілення – це важкий процес. Травма – це подорож в ад, пекло, спуск під земний світ, безпросвідний негреду, пекельні муки та довічні тартури. Такі метафори дає нам підсвідомо, щоб доторкнутися до болю. Цими образами сповнена наша аналітична робота сьогодні. Юнг казав, Бог терору живе в людській душі, і ми, українські аналітики, тепер з ним добре знайомі. Але травма має іншу сторону. Травма констелює архетип ініціації. Травма може бути як ініціація сокрального духовного потенціалу в людині. Цілення – це крихкий баланс болю і сенсу. Це нова цілісність. Нарешті, наш довгий шлях до цілення. Ми маємо віру і надію знайти інтуїтивну мудрість та віру в життя, щоб зробити свій квантовий стробок, як українське суспільство та нація. Та прорив для, до більш глибокого парадоксу життя, як окремої особистості. У мене кожного разу виникає питання, що нам допомагає? Я вважаю, що ми несвідомо тримаємось за внутрішні цінності, за нашу центральну ось. Саме вона утримує життя всередині психіки. Це мачта Одисея в штормовому морі житті. І в кожній людини вона своя. Ми, українці, тримаємось за мачту, за свої цінності. Це свободу, єдність, тікість та незалежність. Дякую. Дякую, дякую, Інна. Ну, перш за все, я хотів би, звичайно, подякувати присутнім тут людям. І я вражений цим зібранням. Я бачу своїх колег, своїх друзів, своїх учителів. І саме головне, я бачу авторів фантастичних книжок, які наповнюють юнгіанський світ. І е, це, справді, мною переживається, наче як таке розширення того контейнеру, який нам так не вистачає зараз. Для переживання всього того хаосу, в який ми потрапили, з яким ми зіткнулися. Вісім е, років вже йде війна з Украї... України з Росією. Е, ну, останні три місяці вона набула просто якоїсь жахливої такої фази. Ми втрачаємо близьких людей, звичний спосіб життя. На наших очах бувається інфраструктура і руйнуються наші міста і села. І як люди, і як психологи ми зіткнулися з захлинаючим досвідом індивідуальних історій про насильство, тортури, приниження, мародерство з боку російських військових. Ну і окрема біль пов'язана з вимушеним переселенням, переселенням мільйонів співвітчизників. Всі мої колеги майже без виключення перебувають в різних періодах переживання психологічної травми. В певному, я би це назвав, такому травматичному стані психіки. І з цього стану можливі, на мій погляд, два виходи. Або в якісь прогреси на індивідуацію або в посттравматичний стресовий розлад. І е, справді від нас всіх залежить оцей е, жахливий, такий важкий, несвідомий вибір. Трохи краще це переживають, на мій погляд, колеги, які вже мали безпосередній досвід війни на Сході України. Ті, що працювали на Сході, ті, що воювали, ну, як і я також. Але, ви знаєте, це просто жахлива різниця, вражаюча різниця. І е, українська армія, звичайно, змінилася за сім років. І наше суспільство фантастично змінилося за ці сім, е, вісім років. Але змінилися і росіяни. І це саме велике такий е, жах для мене і розчарування. Е, 
я вже бачив цього ворога, але такого ворога я точно ще не бачив. Щось таке дивне відбувається всередині, ну, на, на, на півночі нашої країни. Да? Наш сусід трансформується якимось абсолютно дивним і досить монструозним чином. Ем... В цьому тумані війни дуже легко загубити головні сенси нашого буття і нашого існування. От головне, що ми відстоюємо, я хотів би це підкреслити, да, це наша незалежність як держави і наші, в наших індивідуальних історіях. І це продовжується не три місяці, не вісім років. Це історія довжиною в декілька століть з періодами військових загострень, періодами співіснування, які тільки зовні виглядали мирним. Розширення імперії завжди і всюди мало гібридний характер, при якому проникнення йде на всіх рівнях існування – військовому, культурному, релігійному, побутовому і, саме головне, мовному. В російсько-українській війні цей агонізуючий державний стиль набув екстремального прояву. В рік на пропаганду Російська Федерація витрачає кошти співставні з бюджетом деяких невеликих країн. Україна досить впевнено просунулась в напрямку економічної військової незалежності. Але в культурному, релігійному, мовному вимірі ми все ще залишаємося окупованими. Це в повній мірі стосується і аналітичної спільноти. Освіта України рішуче рухається в напрямку європейських стандартів, спираючись на загальносвітові цінності. І війна призвела до вибухового породження нових символічних образів, спротиву, і незалежності. Ви можете це бачити в популярних мемах. Я зараз хотів би вам трошки показати, е, е, якщо така можливість є, а вона є. Ось. Е, я сподіваюся, ви бачите. Е, дивіться. Кожного із нас зачіпала ця війна. Оце Бородянка, це місто за 10 кілометрів від будинка мого батька. Ну, це, можливо, ви бачили цю картинку, це те, що точно не було 8 років назад так страшно і поширено. Ми очікували чого завгодно, але оця хвиля насильства над жінками і мородерства – це абсолютно якийсь новий феномен, який ми точно не бачили навіть у росіян раніше. А це школа, це школа в Лісичанську. Зараз ідуть самі так запеклі бої, прямо зараз, прямо в ці хвилини. Оце школа, де навчалася моя мама. Цю школу побудували в 1910 році бельгійські інженери. І з тих пір вона давала освіту, і це була українська школа. От зараз ви бачите, що з нею відбувалося. Це фотографії буквально там тижня, можливо. Це, знаєте, символи війни, які дуже люблять українці. Подивіться, це така шавка. Це сьомий поверх обірваної будівлі. І ви бачите, що шавка так настільки по-хазяйськи міцно прибита, що там навіть зберіглися, бачите, е, ну, такі е, посуд. І навіть отакий півник, типовий український півник, бачите, він зберігся, він висить. І ця будівля, вона напівіснує, якби, да? а при цьому ця шавка, ви бачите, вона вижила. Це теж Бородянка, це теж поблизу там, де живе мій батько, в Київській області. Ну і тут ви бачите, я не знаю, як ці лелеки виживають, але вони виживають. І я думаю, що це теж має такий, знаєте, відновлюючий сенс. А це фотографія із Маріуполя, із підвалів Маріуполя. 
ну, я не знаю, я думаю, що це теж дуже такі вражаючі образи. Саме через відтворення символів ми можемо відчути справжній глибинний рух до незалежності і відтворення власної ідентичності. Але символи народжуються не на пустому місці, має бути ґрунт. І таким ґрунтом є мова, українська мова для нас. Це процес спирається на зв'язки з сучасною світовою культурою і забезпечується перш за все розвитком мови напряму і е, такою прямою взаємодією з е, світом. Для, для культурного майбутнього нашого 40-мільйонного народу надважливо мати прямі, якісні переклади, в тому числі і професійні, юнга. І я тут бачу абсолютно ну, на наших, на, в, нашій, в нашій цій е, події е, фантастичних авторів, які є ну, лідерами, по суті, юнгіанських текстів, юнгіанської літератури і е, книжок і статей. І ми дуже вдячні вам, правда, за допомогу нашим колегам з Круті безпосередньо. І ви, я дуже вдячний, що ви підтримуєте їх безпосередньо. І кошти, які ми збираємо, я думаю, підуть безпосередньо людям, які це потребують. Але я хочу звернутися до вас ще з більш стратегічним проханням. Я хочу наважитись на це. Ця війна скінчиться нашою перемогою на полі бою, ми в це віримо. Але культурна залежність і недиференційованість будуть залишатися постійними чинниками майбутніх конфліктів. Ну така доля склалася, така, такий у нас сусід, він нікуди не дінеться. І е, ми працюємо дуже багато над перекладами, але економічна ситуація складається не на нашу користь. На відміну від України, в Росії останнім часом Систематично нехтуються авторські права, як в випадку, наприклад, червоної і чорних книг Юнга. Можливо, я не відкрию вам ніякого секрету. І це сильно здешевлює друк і абсолютно спотворює конкуренцію. У нас дуже багато перекладів російських, не дуже якісних. А українські переклади, вони не витримують такої кількості видань. видань і нам досить складно це робити. От. Тому я справді думаю, як нам це влаштувати в майбутньому. І звертаюсь до вас за, з таким проханням. Можливо, ми створимо якийсь фонд чи якусь групу, хто буде зацікавлений в цьому приймати участь. Від нас, звичайно, теж ми готові досить активно це включатися. І ще дещо важливе я хотів сказати про переклади. І ще... В червні цього року ми готуємо 10-ю ювілейну конференцію української групи розвитку EAP. Тема була ще довоєнна і така мирна, про символ дому. Вона була присвячена українському перекладу книжки нашого шановного майстра Джона Хіла, якого ви всі знаєте чудово, із Цюріха чи із Кюснах, та, чи, то, точніше сказати. Ми назвали конференцію «Бути вдома у собі та світі». Тож зараз під час війни ця тема набала драматичного, навіть трагічного змісту. Ми чекаємо всіх зацікавлених 25-26 червня, приєднуйтесь до нас в онлайні, буде переклад, звичайно, на англійську мову, і я наважусь дати посилання, якщо ви не проти, в, в нашому чаті. От я зараз це роблю. Будь ласка, знаходьте нас і, будь ласка, приєднуйтесь. Я думаю, буде цікаво. Тобто, побачите, там прекрасні доповідачі будуть. І я думаю, що ви дізнаєтесь досить багато про те, що відбувається справді в Україні, як ми працюємо, як ми виживаємо. І дякую ще раз за увагу. Thank you very much, Dmitry. And please do put the details of that conference in the chat. That would be very helpful. Thank you. And thank you, Ina, as well. So now we come to Anne Ulanov's talk. 
this evening and after the talk there'll be the results of the auction and then thanks. So Dr. Anne Belford Ulanoff is a Jungian analyst practicing in New York. She's known internationally through her writing and is much in demand as a teacher and speaker. She is the recipient of a number of awards, including the Gravida Award for Finding Space, Winnicott, God and the Psychic Reality, and the Oscar Feister Award from the American Psychiatry Association for her work on psychiatry and religion. She is Emerita Professor of Psychology and Religion at Union Theological Seminary and is the author of many books about Jungian psychology, religion and the feminine. I first came across her work many years ago when I read her book on Envy, Cinderella and Her Sisters, one of the books Anne co-wrote with her late husband, Barry Ulanov. Anne's latest book is Back to Basics, written during the pandemic. It aims to find a new language to express concepts in analytical psychology. This evening, Anne is going to speak to us about her reflections on Jung's thoughts in his Red Book and the Black Books, and what this can offer about the current situation in Ukraine. When we met with Anne the other evening to talk about her paper, she told us that she'd never worked so hard on any paper she'd written. Anne, we're honoured to have you speak with us this evening and warmly welcome you. Thank you. So I, everyone hears me, I'm on properly. Greetings. We gather as analysts, as friends and students of Jung in this cruciform moment of life and death, good and evil, fighting and praying, rescuing and being rescued, mourning and dying. We gather to support Ukraine, and particularly you analysts, financially, morally, and affectionately. To say we admire your endurance and skills to stand with your land, your courage and simple kindness in many instances to those suffering. Many of us feel disoriented by the invasion of your country. The family of my late husband, Barry Ulanov, comes from a small village near Kiev, many of whom were killed in the 1930s famine, in World War II, and under the Soviet Union. Our son, Alexander, worked in Kiev and Donetsk from 2008 to 2015 and was present in the 2014 war, helping to evacuate families from Donets and to find employment for others. He works now here to send support and aid to you there. We think of your sister, your brother, your parents, your grandparents, your children, your friends, your communities, for whom everything is lost overnight and who suffer the maximum of psychic terror. I beg your pardon in advance for any offending presumption to speak to you in your suffering from a place here where electricity, plumbing, food, a bed, and quiet exist, and no constant terror looms. I offer you three parallels between Jung's red and black books, experience of finding his soul and the images from which he created analytical psychology in 1913 to 32, and during the outbreak of World War I, and the parallel with your experience in 2022 of outbreak of war in Ukraine, and behind it, an existential threat of World War III. 
The first parallel concerns individuation process, which Jung formulated out of his experience of the unconscious and his search for his lost soul. He reminds us that consciousness is but a very small part of the psyche, whose greater part is, quote, unconscious fact, hard as granite, immovable, inaccessible, yet ready at any time to come crashing down on us. The gigantic catastrophes that threaten us today are psychic epidemics. At any moment, several millions of people may be smitten by a new madness, unquote. The invasion of Ukraine is now a psychic epidemic falling on you and behind you, threatening the wider world. Yet in the midst of fear and determination, we feel as well the psyche, your psyche, my psyche, meet with the force of our own individuation process as well. Jung writes, quote, when the psyche as objective fact, hard as granite and heavy as lead, confronts us as an inner experience and addresses us saying, this is what will be and must be. Your own individuation process is happening to you right in the midst of the collective psychic epidemic of war all over your country and threatening countries at your border. In this cruciform moment, we feel, most, we feel both personal and collective upheaval happening to us and all around us. The spirit of the depths at this moment is the spirit of the times. Yet we have from Jung, whose work changed our lives and to whom we owe our professions, the training to work with psyche familiar to us and also the you of psyche unknown to us. Despite being stripped by suffering of all energy, you may draw upon the reservoir of consciousness to register the horrors of what is happening and the glints of gold miraculously there as well. We draw on the learning of how to relate to the collective and not be buried in it. Like Jung searching and finding his soul, as his red and black books tell us, your search for soul may find you and you too will know about what transcends psyche. As Philemon, a symbol of the self in the red book says, Quote, we each will pray to our one God as the bridge across death. This is an historical moment. Peace and war confront. President Zelensky of Ukraine broadcasts directly to President Putin of Russia, who instigated the invasion. Quote, we are a peaceful nation. Stop your armies. If not, we will protect our land. What to do? Ordinary life is invaded. Many citizens are soldiers, fighting day after night and night after day, ready to fire, ready to dodge, ready to push the enemy back away from your cities. Many citizens must leave, torn from all that is dear and familiar, comfort of home, sleeping at night, leaving behind everything but the clothes on their backs. Many citizens who must stay suffer the sheer noise, the daily cacophony of bombs and sirens both generated by your tough resilience, we may be witnessing dictatorship 
undergoing its own disintegration and democracy evolving into new forms. We have something to offer as analysts. A supportive parallel instructs us. When Jung searched for his lost soul, she climbed out of a dark shaft in the earth. He looked down into the unconscious and found at first nothing, only a blank. Despite his professional success and fame, home and children, he was empty inside. You must feel that nothing, that blank with the world crashing down around you. Jung stoked his psyche by reading religious, esoteric, mythopoetic materials and discovered, quote, something was living down there. His unconscious then erupted with dramatic affects, bizarre imagery, strange fantasies. He feared he was losing his mind. A psychosis threatened. You must feel that way too in the midst of the chaos all around you and feeling it will catch you as you seek other lands for your children. When World War I broke out, Jung saw a space between his material and the eruption of the world. The collision of personal and collective pushed apart a space and Jung discerned patterns of the human psyche. He was not falling into madness, but seeing what was true for all of us. So look for the patterns, meditate on them as native to our human community and see your own process too. What is this war doing to each of you living there? Bodies from the war lying in streets of wrecked towns, uncovering a mass grave in a huge trench behind a gas station, fearing love, ones we love who are fighting will be made dead, wondering if we have the stuff to go on to survive. You can register two processes simultaneously, the psychic epidemic with collective patterns and your individuation process where you learn from heart as well as from book, from madness as well as from reason, from soul aliveness despite loss of meaning, admitting into awareness everything you had scorned as evil that now soaks the world in blood. Though exhausted and numbed, your personal process persists and you can offer dialogue with it, even if it is with despair, that like an unsayable trauma renders you mute. But if the shocking episode is experienced, taken within, even the trauma that escapes words gets worked on to become an inner psychic event, no longer an outer happening that defines us ever after. We make the unsayable experiential and that births images that convey meaning. Such eruption of origini, originary material faces us with two questions. A silent transformation begins. We create and find created a living symbol that keeps within its secret aliveness, a truth that cannot be explained, but only lived. Jung repeats in the Red Book, quote, our life is the truth we seek. We create truth by living it. The two questions that appear make sense of the mad thing that you are doing 
like driving into dangerous war territory, a lorry full of groceries, blankets, water bottles, even toys for those who are trapped and destitute. The two questions are, what are we willing to die for? What are we willing to live for? The personal and collective coincide and something happens. Jung calls it the transcendent function. You suddenly get a new attitude, a new insight, a new release, a living symbol, and it gets you. A second parallel between Jung in 1913 and you in 2022 may be drawn from the experience you share of erupting originary material. Jung was just beginning to discern the living reality of the collective unconscious. The personification of Elijah, whom Jung experienced as quote, real, tells Jung he is not his thoughts, that thoughts arrive, he didn't invent them. Thus breaking up Jung's identification of his I with his thinking and opening him to the objectivity of psychic reality. Further, Jung sees the inextricable connection between what individuals do or fail to do and what happens or fails to happen within the nation. Community and individual life interpenetrate. Hence, even what we suffer and do not resolve contributes to communal and national life that tells us that our suffering, though real, does not break us. That gives us hope when we feel so helpless against bombs and bullets and scarcities. Who knows, what you suffer may help us work through the suffering that afflicts us. The spirit, whether of the times or of the depths, is something we all live in together. The water of your tears may irrigate an arid place in me toward life. There are many examples now in Ukraine of this interpenetration of personal and collective. Ordinary elderly women interviewed on CNN express a determined will to fight with guns and the right to learn to shoot. A man interviewed on the radio identifies himself as the coach of an amateur football team called the Wolfies. He only adds later that as a medical doctor, he's busy now delivering bandages, syringes, surgical gloves, medicines necessary in combat. When fighting is over, he says, he will return to his coaching, the Wolfies. The persistence of Ukraine is assumed. I laughed out loud hearing his loving of his Wolfies over his medical dedication in the midst of war, his confidence that he would return to them. I felt awe of this seriously funny moment of life occurring in the midst of destructiveness. Another interview, E, on the radio, an artist chooses to stay in her southern port city under attack, saying we cannot all leave, some must stay. She's busy digitalizing her art into the cloud, so it will not be lost, but be there for the Ukraine of the future. The major parallel 
to do with the personal and collective in Jung's 1913 fantasies and now in our 2022 experience concerns their difference. It, it shows in two ways how the collective presents itself and how we deal with it. The collective unconscious appears to Jung in the image of hordes of dead crowding into his fantasies and into his children's sleep. He feels forced to respond and writes three nights in a row the seven sermons to the dead. Jung feels compelled to answer their lament and not to become their spokesman, not to identify with them, but to remain his own finite self. The dead cannot rest in their dying because they fail to find aliveness in living. They suffer from unlived life. They neglected their individuation. Finally, Jung offers them his work of creating analytical psychology in response to their unanswered questions. How to be a person? Tell us about God. Your time now in Ukraine, like Jung's then, presents collective unconscious through image. But your image, I suggest, is different. For Jung, it was the hordes of dead with their questions. Your image, I suggest, is erasure. The collective unconscious in its psychic epidemic form confronts us in the image of erasure. February 24, 2022, Putin, president of Russia, justifies invading Ukraine by declaring you're not an independent country. You never have been and you never will be. You belong to Russia. You do not have a culture of your own. You are a better part of Russia's culture. Like a schoolyard bully who sees something he wants, and takes it because he can, he declares to the world that Ukraine is ours and their 20 years of paper, papers by Putin to legitimize his attempted theft. Erasure is the refusal to see the otherness of the other. We rub out their independent existence. The attack of erasure on Ukraine brings to mind with acuity and with confession too, erasures of all kinds going on in our world. Examples are legion, wars of white supremacy over people of color, of conquerors over indigenous people, of coercing autocratic dictatorships over every citizen's right to vote in their leaders. We learn from the schoolyard, the most powerful response is all the children surrounding the bully whose power complex disintegrates. Your fighting attempts to circle the enemy that circles you to proclaim we protect our land, we exist from deep roots growing our boundaries on the outside and our culture on the inside. A crucial difference between the personal and collective unconscious is how we deal with each. We can with work integrate into our identity significant parts of our personal unconscious and assimilate a surface layer of our society's shadow. We cannot integrate the collective unconscious as part of our identity. It's too big, too vast. Its forces are impersonal, not personal. Massive, not particular. Mania results 
if we're invaded and identify with unconscious, collective, archetypal symbols. It is as if we plug into high electric voltage that we cannot turn off, that can explode. If we repress its force, it's like living with a hand grenade within. President Putin gives me the impression of having crossed the line as if his complex of power mania has, in addition, down at the bottom of it, a hole, a hole in the power mania complex. Through that lesion, pure, undiluted, unadulterated archetypal energy fuels his presumed identity as the one with the mission to construct a, Ro a Russian empire with extended boundaries and sovereignty as if he, the czar. That ambition flirts in his repeated threats, if not obeyed, to use nuclear or chemical weapons. In the red and black books, Jung shows not to fall into a state of identity with the fantasies of the collective unconscious, but to relate to them. We personify them, engage in dialogue with them, argue with them, say we do not understand, develop our ego point of view, and receive their unfolding of purpose and meaning. We are trained as analysts to communicate with this voice of the collective unconscious, not to become it, nor possessed by it. The original material is in each of us with its patterns of communication. It is natural. What turns it pathological is when we identify with unconscious collective fantasy and it replaces reality. Then we reside in it, possessed. It does not reside in us. Then it rules us, and we use its force to rule others. Jung relates to the primordial fantasies of the collective unconscious by writing them down in detail, drawing out their images, and translating them later into concepts of his structure of the psyche. Relating to collective unconscious forces instead of identifying with them is the crucial differentiating line between being in touch with the taproot of the psyche portrayed in primordi primordial images and pathologically replacing reality with the images. The turmoil of war stirs up tremendous affect and riotous images of cruelty, blood, wreckage of beauty, of evil itself, and sparks of unimaginable goodness of one person to another, or that one synchronicity that saved your life that day from total immersion in chaos. In the devastation of your beautiful country, to relate to the psychic epidemic that has crashed on you, you may develop a ritual of gratitude, a veneration of the God you lost, the scent of your baby's skin, the softness of your lover's lips may be vital images of life in the midst of death around you. Images that secure you on this side of the line between aliveness and deadness. Things you discarded from religion come unbidden to your lips. Styles of philosophical thinking alchemical images of negredo, putrefactio, wisps of poetry, spontaneous praying to a hidden 
but oddly near God just happened to you. You have the capacity of human creative symbol making that confers the power of aliveness, even in the evil of destructiveness. And along with this comes the dumbing of all your faculties because your body needs sleep, food, strength. Your body may repeat rituals of childhood or sense connection to transcendent source the soul points to beyond the psyche as well as within it. One example is in a hospital in the southeastern city of Ukraine without power, electricity, medical equipment, in wreckage. People crowd into darkness of the basement to secure safety against the bombing. The obstetrician took her birthing patient, patient there and use flashlights to help her with the delivery. The whole basement people, she said, listened, silent, waiting in the dark for the infant's cry at birth. When the cry came, everyone broke into cheers. The miracle in the midst of evil. Jung found a check on evil in his struggle to find his place as a human being located between the gods and the demons, between our finite being and the seeming infinite of the unconscious. I fight for freedom and the life of man, he says. This does not deify the human not the man, but man's primordial kernel. We cannot integrate evil and destructiveness. We can, I suggest, use the check of the blessings of our finite lives and the symbols that radiate its life force as a source of steadiness. Jung offers this insight when we are growing, good and evil go together in a mysterious way. When we stop growing, they fall apart into hostile rivalry. Do they reconcile? I don't know, says Jung. It happens in the dark, behind your back, that they go together not merging, not annulling one another, existing distinctly in that irrepresentable psychoid layer of psyche. Recognizing this mysterious going together of evil and good makes a space for our anger at this war and at the egregious crimes against civilians that exceed the rules of war. Here we find the place of hate that grips us towards someone trying to erase our very existence. I find the place of hate means holding in consciousness the direct, the destructive force. This takes brutal strength not to act out in sadism against the enemy, becoming ourselves the monster in, to fight the monster attacking us, nor to act out against ourselves for being so exhausted and afraid, nor do we repress the terrific energy of hate. We cannot assimilate hate. It partakes of archetypal force of destructiveness, which is such as it is, not reducible 
to social construction as its origin, though that contributes to its venom. We hold an awareness and relate to hate and do not identify with it, nor ignore our limits. Hate has a place in us, but does not define us. We find rituals to bury the dead, to give thanks for our lives, to devise war strategies, to force periods of time out in order to resume fighting later. Hate, I suggest, is the first protest from the gut, from the bowels, from the back of our throat screaming in rage. The first protest against erasure, asserting agency, subjectness, saying, I, we, do, exist. The act of holding hate in consciousness begins something that may transform it and make ways to relate to it. Like underground water, we may irrigate the spirit around us for everyone to recognize and uniquely shape the life force that comes through them so it will not be lost to the world. Evil is the kidnapping of that life and deporting people to nowhere. A third parallel from Jung's Red and Black books in 1913 and World War I and today in 2022 in the war against Ukraine is the voice of the feminine in Jung's personification of Salome. She first appears in the Red Book as murderous, crazy, blind, quote, because she didn't see the meaning of things. She last appears as a sane, sighted woman who wants to give her love to Jung. He recoils, quote, you would stifle my freedom. He says, no, you live your life fully. I will so live mine his inferior foot feeling and relation to the feminine did develop. However, he committed to love itself. First he put life, then love, and love as psyche, and devotion to do whatever was asked of him, pay the costs, serve psychic reality. It's dangerous to note the feminine as source, given how much harm has been done to women and to the feminine in men by the concept, its misuse and discrimination against it still. Feminism has done a massive recalling of its truth in new forms, but we still have much to do. The Black books bring new originary, originary material. Salome, in particular, brings a resource to the heroism and the abject suffering going on now in Ukraine. The soul chides Jung, stop holding the feminine in contempt. Stop thinking women are a burden you have to give to. See that they are offering to give something to you. Salome gains her sight when she and when Jung recognize she is part of his soul. Imagine. She stands against Jung repeatedly insisting she explain herself by insisting he see her different departure point. We need this particular feminine stand 
to secure the realness of Ukraine's national identity with its own soul. The soul has three parts in the red and black books. The serpent, the earthly essence of the human, Salome, and a part called soul. This threesome makes up the entirety of soul in these texts. Without the Salome part, in distinction from the other two parts, the whole soul is not real in daily life, nor in the world as anima mundi. Salome is the materia of soul, the matter where, quote, the light shows itself only as matter. Without her, we lose the sense of what matters. Loss of home, infliction of rape, torture, murder, deportation, aim to destroy the realness of U Ukraine. The fight exhausts and numbs all participants. Who has time to grieve when we must plot our escape route? How to reassure, reassure our children when the bombs keep falling? We need the tough realness of the feminine to stay steady with the matter that exists right now. Salome makes things real. Her nature is matter that exists in its own right. Fact, realness of your ongoing personal being and the being of your country. The realness persists under the rubble. The importance of seeing this is underlined by the soul part of soul, saying she can be lured into evil as the shiny bridge to the ultimate when she fails to believe enough in Jung. Jung sees he falls into destructiveness when he fails to believe in the primordial kernel, the tiny seed in his human self, standing between the gods and the demons. The salvific moment is to trust this adamantine tiny grain of sand that goes on existing in us, relating to the whole of reality the divine and the dreadful. We are a space where heaven and hell meet and the feminine meets what I suggest is disordered masculine in Putin's power mania. Real fantasies, real existing images meet real external events. Disordered masculine happens when we forget both are real, real image and real event, not to be merged, not one to be subsumed by the other, but each in its true place. Madness and psychic epidemic break out when archetypal fantasy replaces external reality. That mad replacement by fantasy over reality is my impression of Putin being in the grip of unadulterated archetypal energy as his mission tries to replace existing countries with an image of himself ruling a Russian empire. Jung tangles with Salome when he repeatedly questions her What's your mystery? What's your meaning? And we may ask in the midst of war, what is the meaning of this mayhem, this havoc of everything we hold dear? Is there any abiding truth? Salome answers, I have no mystery or meaning. I am matter. Indeed, the wonder of matter 
which is the counterpole to God, but explains, says Jung, falling again into his identification of thinking with consciousness. Reading that, I thought of the cosmic meaning of consciousness for Jung. When in Africa, gazing at the Afi plain of Nairobi and at the gigantic herds of animals moving forward like slow rivers, Jung says he suddenly grasps they exist because he sees them. He finds his myth, quote, man is the second creator of the world who alone has given to the world its objective existence without which it would have gone on in the profoundest night of non-being to its unknown end. You who are fighting in Ukraine must often feel, quote, that profoundest night of non-being has descended upon you. Yet you are conscious of its cosmic meaning of consciousness. That's present to you. But remember, the text tells us Salome is, quote, the being of non-being accompanying you in the darkness as fact, isness, sensation, the matter from which all that matters gets born. Salome brings something before consciousness that we live rather than know about. This is, quote, light that is no knowledge, but fact. She personifies a resource, even in the midst of war. She, as a note of the feminine, is before images and words. She is matter, from which we learn to live what matters. The soul calls Salome her sister, without whom there would be no meaning, and on whom soul depends, quote, Salome is making the unsayable experiential. That is your feminine resource in the darkness of the unspeakable suffering going on now in Ukraine. This helps us in war where no explanation will ever be adequate. She does not see, as does Jung, with consciousness. She is, and says, let events happen, so that all parts have a share in life. Salome loves pure, eternal pleasure and pure matter itself. From this is birthed eternal images that the soul loves, images from which meaning is bestowed and our creative symbol-making capacity is born and evokes meaningfulness in living. Might we say Salome is beingness, where we mo momentarily renounce development and understanding to allow grief for loss, to allow rage against suffering, to allow hope for all citizens to fight against erasure, to allow intuition, right now is the time to escape, or right now is the time to stand fast. From this feminine matter, you may feel now in your body what matters, Bear it in your mind. Believe it in your heart. A sense of what loves you and holds your soul in being, even in the madness of war. May I close with speaking our admiration for you, holding Ukraine's front lines. You analyzing in the midst of noise of war you delivering groceries, 
you trying to find places of safety, you trying to arrange a life now each day for your children, you letting the certainty permeate you that you fight against erasure for the realness of Ukraine. We honor you, we stand with you, we keep you in mind and heart. May I credit Catherine Cox, whose generative idea originated this effort to raise monies for you, to thank her and the numerous volunteers of the excellent team who worked tirelessly to create this occasion, to gather with you and to send the monies to you. Thank you. May God keep you. Thank you, Anne. That was immense. And it feels almost as if, as if silence is really the only appropriate response. <laughs> there isn't any other response I feel that would be worthy of your talk. You have certainly brought the spirit of the depths to the, the spirit of our times and grounded us in something that endures even in the extremes of war. Thank you. When you said last night that um, this is the paper that you'd worked the hardest on, that is really evident from the scope and the depth of what you have grappled with and woven together. And it cannot possibly be digested in one hearing. And that, I think, is a wonderful thing. Um, because this meeting will very shortly come to a close. And it's really rather wonderful that we have got something so rich, so layered, so full of, um, the wealth is the word that is in my mind. It doesn't fit quite grammatically, but that we can take away and over the months ahead, because there are going to be very, very difficult months ahead. Over the months ahead, we can come back to this paper time and time again, pick it up and find new things in it and new things within ourselves as we respond to it. So we are going to make this paper available as widely as we possibly can for anyone who would like to have it and will be translated into Ukrainian as well. And after something so rich and so deep, um, I'm now going to announce the auction results, which I have here. Um, firstly, I'm going to announce the results of the Ukrainian special auction. The UJA has won Ursula Witz, and the USAP, the developing group, has won George Hoganson. So I hope you have happy meetings together. And the Finance Committee has also emailed me through the um, prizes from the main draw. So I'll read these out as quickly as you can, because I'm sure you're all very keen to hear. Christopher Hawke, Jean Palmer Daly, Anne Shearer, Ruth Williams, Marion Dunley, Ali Cliff, Lisa Masciano has gone to Jim Heaver, Donald Calshed, Calshed has been won by Kathy Keller, Murray Stein has gone to Peter T. Dunlap, Dale Mathers and Anna B. Heiniger, Sona Shandasani has gone with Sharon Heath, Joseph Cambray has been won by Christopher Scanlon, George Hoganson by Anna Penelope Dudley, Lionel Corbett by Katrin Wertz, Tom Sinner, Singer by Anna Bulat, Polly Young Eisendrath by Rachel Dunkley Jones, Ursula Wirtz by Larissa Karlanova, Susan Schwartz goes to Fiona Bergri Hooper. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Verena Cast has gone to Kristen Castellano, Renos Papadopoulos to Panita Miranda, and Dimitri Zaleski to Norio Matsumoto. And I can announce that the um, that the auction has raised two thousand five hundred pounds for our Ukrainian analysts, which is great. So we'll add that to the ticket price and to the donations, and then hopefully we've got about fifty people on the list, and it will be divided and distributed as quickly as possible. So that's it for me, and I'm going to hand over to Catherine once again for the goodbyes. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. So it only remains for me to thank you all very much for coming and for donating. The donations with the GoFundMe um, 
website will remain open for another week and you can access these through our, our website for Ukrainian unions. So many people have helped us in organizing this event and we really could not have done it without you all. Everyone gave very generously of their time without payment. And in particular, we'd like to thank all the organizing committee, which included unions and non-unions, for all your tireless hard work and enormous dedication. It would not have happened without you. Confer for coming on board with us at very short notice. We thank the whole team at Confer for your creativity and innovation and for giving so generously of your time. The Social Dream Matrix conveners for very careful, thoughtful and thorough preparation. All our analysts in the auction for giving up your time and for the webinar series yet to come. Anya, our wonderful interpreter, you are brilliant. The International Association for Analytical Psychology for all your support and for publicising the event so widely. The Guild of Analytical Psychology for its support as well. And Maxim Ilyashenko for your advice and assistance. Sadly, Maxim is not here today because he's helping his refugee family. Thank you too to the two presidents of the Ukrainian societies, Inna Kirilluk and Valentina Samus for working with us on this event. And thanks also to Vlad Kunets, Dmitry Zelensky, and all our Ukrainian colleagues who inspired this event. And of course, Anne Ulanov, your paper has given us so much. Thank you.